Welcome to Threads of Enlightenment. As usual, I'd like to take my time and pay and give honor to my guests for a couple of things that I deem personally very expensive because I know how it is for me. My time is valuable. And so I want to thank Elizabeth for coming and sharing some of this commodity that I deem very expensive and priceless in many ways. The other is her story, the journey that made her who she is today. And she is going to allow us to, uh, via her uh, story, to learn of her, to see what tools she utilized to make her the great spirit and woman that she is today. And it is our hope that as we have this conversation, that we also would grow from her knowledge so that we can become better human spirits while we occupy this beautiful space called Earth. Elizabeth, thank you so much for coming to Threads of Enlightenment. Ken, good morning. Uh, thank you so much for having the pleasure of getting to know you and being part of Thank you. Tell the people the things that you have. I, I always relate it to giving birth because we, we were pregnant with these things. And through our journey, we were able to dis discover them, unearth them, and then we released them. And uh, through those uh, babies, if you will, that we release, we are now serving others. Tell them all of the things that you have released and are now in that space of serving. So that with uh, me as a real girl. So since I was really young, I've always been a child, which is very, I was the worst student when it came to <laughs> math and I ran. I struggled through all of the grade school with math, but I was always um, attracted to numbers, which is which is so ironic. So um, as parents will do sometimes, they give you uh, allowance for helping with chores and, and those types of things. So as a little girl, I would say seven, eight years old, I used to take my money that I would get a dollar a week or whatever, and I stick it in a, in, not a piggy, into a mattress. <laughs> We're talking about <laughs> the 80s here. And I found a little pocket that I would stick my little stash into the mattress. I have uh, four older brothers and a younger sister, and my brothers were always dating, and they would never have money, and they would want to find my little stash, and, oh, I can borrow it. So I found my little pocket that they didn't know about, and I used to put my money in there. Well, eventually, I started loaning them the money. Wow. I didn't know much about, you know, um, interest back then, because I would have been a little bit richer, but anyway. <laughs> It's just at that young age when I reflect back in life that I started budgeting. Um, if I knew I would be getting, let's say, 40 bucks that year, I already had in my mind a plan of how that $40 was going to be utilized. Um, you know, for every occasion, okay, it's Mother's Day, Father's Day, birthdays, Christmas. This is an allocation I already had in terms of this is what I can afford afford to spend on this person for this occasion. I already had that budgeted um, at eight years old. So that's kind of where I would say the first instance of my passion with budgeting, finances, um, and money, and just being able to afford things uh, came to be. <laughs> As I got older, I was really good with just maintaining a budget and making sure that I stayed on plan. I was the first one at 20, I got married to my parents' dismay a little bit earlier than they had hoped. Um, just, I want, I thought that was the right um, thing for me at that point in time. I got into, I got pregnant, um, and then my husband and I, I looked into life insurance for, for us, for the baby, for a uh, college fund, things back in your thinking, the early 90s that are like, what? What is a 529? I was already engaging in those things because I was curious and I wanted to learn and I was always thinking uh, ahead. I wanted to make sure that if I'm bringing a little person into this world, I wanted to make sure that I can set them up for abundance, for um, a good, stable future. Um, however, um, I got a divorce uh, a few years after my son wasn't quite three yet. And um, I kind of fell into a, a little bit of a a spiral in the in the wrong direction. So um, over the years, I accumulated over three hundred thousand. There were some illnesses. Um, there were things as a single parent that you do because you think that's what I have to do to make sure that this child now doesn't feel the loss of the other parent, doesn't feel that separation that your ha household is broken. So I went in um, thinking that if I took him on a lot of trips, I bought a lot of expensive things that would help to fill that void that maybe he had of mommy and daddy not being together. <coughs> in addition to that, I moved from New York where I was raised to Florida and didn't have much 
much of a thought. I was just like, I brought my son to Disney and just was very spontaneous and said, you know, I want to have the life of Disney. And I gave him, and that's pretty much how I ended up in that huge debt. Um, but that was also a time in life that wasn't just challenging, but it was also um, a time that allowed me to and allowed me to mature. And, um, sometimes you have to fall down on the floor and hit your knees a little bit hard to realize, oh my God, what am I doing here? And at that point in time, then you choose. I can either stay down here and feel sorry for myself, or I can tr get myself up, dust myself off, and move ahead, look ahead. So I decided to stop feeling sorry for myself, to stop feeling sorry and using my situation as a, as a crutch. And I said, this is not my life. This is not who I am. And I just started to pick up the pieces and put them together. It wasn't easy, but slowly I started going back to the things I knew. I learned to live within my means. I learned to getting back to a plan of budgeting. You can't mm. go spend what you don't have. Um, <laughs> stop leveraging plastic. Stop looking for things that are really not a necessity. Things, I mean, in life, yes, we all want the best for our families. We want the best for ourselves. I'm not saying that we don't need, deserve to take a good vacation. We don't deserve to have a nice dinner, but we don't deserve to constantly live on flight. We don't constantly deserve to be in debt. And that was the kind of the lifestyle that I had become accustomed to just because I thought that was the way of bridging that gap now that was my broken. <coughs> so what I did is I just had to regain my confidence. I had to rebuild me from the inside. Mm -hmm. I had to believe in myself again, and I had to show myself that I can do this. I can do this as a single mom, um, you know, and I had to be that strength for my son. I got out of an abusive relationship because for him, um, I didn't want him being raised thinking that was a norm. So um, I said, I did this for the right reason, but I ended up at the wrong place. So yeah. um, using him as my benchmark, I said, I am going to be a better person and I'm going to teach him the right way of using money in life. So I started building tools. I started using Excel. I started using databases. I started learning, reading as much as I can in terms of spirituality, in terms of mindset, gaining, regaining your confidence, moving from hurt and, and healing. Um, so it took me a while to really stop sabotaging my own success and healing from within. It takes a while. Um, I want to go back a little further, go back. Um, we, we'll get back to, to, to here. You were a young, a young girl. Um, where did you, Elizabeth, think you picked up that curiosity about money and saving? Do you remember, do you recall... Was it a conversation with someone? How did you begin to do that? Was it just something you started internally or did you hear it somewhere? No, when uh, we were um, growing up, it was really hard. We struggled a lot. My parents struggled a lot. My father was an alcoholic. Um, so he, a lot of the income that came in went out with his with his poor house. Um, so mm -hmm. whatever little that we did have, there were six mouths to feed. My mother was um, a home. Mm -hmm. and literally take the dollar and stretch it in so many ways. So I saw the way she was so articulate, how she the household, and that even if she can afford to give us five cents back in the, you know, in the late 70s, five cents back home in, in, in British Guyana was a lot of money. I was a little kid back then, five, six years old, in, in first grade nursery school. And yeah. taking five cents would last me the entire week to buy a little treats or little treats for my sister. So... I think that's where it started, just the little bit that she had and how far she took it and all the things that she was still able to accomplish, even mm -hmm. when there was so much adversity against her. Um, so she's my she's my biggest inspiration. And she's taught me so well. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little choked up. Um, she's taught me so well in terms of you never give up. Not, it yeah. doesn't matter what life throws at you. You can either absorb it and become the better person for it or you can lay there and just stay in, in, in that situation. So I think that's where I got a lot of the motivation and a lot of determination that I've had. And some of the things that I've picked up throughout life is just watching the way that she's ran a household and the things that she's been able to accomplish with so much um, odds against her. Yeah. And talk to me. You mentioned that you got married uh, young and uh, you find yourself in, a, uh, in an abusive relationship. 
in that space, because a lot of people are there in that space, what was some of the conversations that you was leveled at you? Because we people try to tell us um, or their opinion of us, if you will. You are less than. And I know that their opinion, because of the proximity of where we are, who we're with and so forth, does have some type of impact in our lives, in our being. Because it, the principle is as you hear these things being repeated over and over, if you become, um, I guess, for lack of a better word, if you become um, uh, susceptible to it, you tend to start believing it. Talk to me about that aspect of your life and some of those things that were leveled at you that you may have allowed to creep in because you're, as you mentioned, you began to deal with it later on after you left because a lot of people, as I mentioned, are in this space. And so we want to identify a couple of things that took place there with you. And then I want to, as we walk through the conversation, to ask the tools that you use to overcome or to change that um, image of who you are. Can you elaborate a little as to some of that conversation and the things that were saying the less than thoughts that were leveled against you to cause you to shift uh, from that little girl to this woman that was in the midst of this trauma. Sure. So during uh, my marriage, um, I was with this individual for a few years before. Um, I had a very strict upbringing. I wasn't allowed to date. Uh, first person that I, I, I liked and at that time thought that I was got married, did the right thing. But he became um, very controlling. And I was always in, very, did very well, very, got very good jobs. Um, and I think there was a level of envy there um, in mm. terms of, oh, well, you're going too fast ahead of me. I can't catch up with you. So I'm going to find another way to inflict harm. And that wow. came in the form of emotion, uh, of mental abuse. Uh, where it would be terrible things that they would like. You're ugly. You're not good enough. You'll never be good enough. Compare you to other people. Um, so it eventually, and being at such a young and fragile age, it, you start to believe those things because yeah. you trust them. And you think that what they're telling you, and if this is what they're seeing, this is also what the world is seeing as. So slowly they start chipping away at the confidence or mm -hmm. that image that you had of yourself. And that's really hard, especially you have a strong role um, in a male figure. So my father was yeah. really absentee. So I kind of put all of my hope into this person. So therefore, I put so much of my affection and, and, and love into them, thinking that they're going to make up, you know, that time yeah. I didn't hide at. And that made it worse because here I'm thinking like, oh, you are the best thing out there. And here he is telling me I was the worst. And I was stupid and I was this and that. And even though when I looked in the mirror, I didn't see what he, what he said. But over time, from you know, it, it was a compounding effect. Hearing it repeatedly yeah. day in, day out, you start to believe it. So now when you look in the mirror, that person that you saw that was confident, that was beautiful, that was vibrant and able to get things done, now you yeah. see them as more of a victim, right? But you don't think of yourself as a victim. You think of yourself as, I'm not good enough. And then yeah. you start putting all of the pressure on yourself. What do I need to make, to make him happy? What do I need to, to please? And therefore, you start to just hurt yourself and, and make yourself um, put yourself in this in the vacuum where you start to shy away from people that might help you, you know, positive people, just because you believe everything this person about you and to you, and you kind of just run away from the world and hide basically is what has happened. So from that point, I was in a really bad spot. I mean, the abuse went from uh, mental and emotional to one day of physical, and that was it. I just just realized at that point, this is not the life I wanted for us, and it's definitely not the life I wanted for a child. So I made a decision that day at 3 o'clock in the morning that I am going to get a divorce. And the next morning at 8 o'clock, I was already at I had no idea of a lawyer. I just heard of a lawyer through a, a, a billboard. I was at eight o'clock. He didn't open until nine o'clock. Wow. I was just that determined because I saw what some other family members have had gone through. And I said, I was not going to be that person. And at that point, I realized, you know, the trajectory of where the marriage, it started as little things, little comments, little 
and then it builds and builds and builds to make you into basically this vibrant person into a skeletal being because they've yeah. taken away all of all of the power, all of the beauty that you had and made you into this thing that nobody really recognized. Yeah. And I think it wasn't until I made that decision that I really realized what happened. And it took me a while to have to uh, find myself. And then after <coughs> I, I, I served him with the divorce paper, he didn't believe it. Because yeah. this was a, a, a person that was so used to being in control. I mean, there's so many things you hear now of a narcissistic person. That's basically yeah. what I was with. You know, um, everything that they're doing, they're putting on you. And, and it's a terrible, terrible situation to be in. And I think so many other people out there are in those situations, but they don't even yes. realize. You know, hopefully I can reach somebody and they can listen to my voice and get out of it sooner. Don't wait until it, don't wait until it gets to the point where there's no turning back. Don't wait until it gets to the point where someone's putting a knife to your throat or a gun to your head or har harming your children or harming family members. If you are in a relationship that you feel is not complimenting you, then you need to run and you need to not look back. You just need to run. Um, and like I said, it's when I took that, when I served them with that divorce paper, I cried and it was a cry of me. I'm going to finally rebuild who I was. It was a cry mm -hmm. to just let go of all the negativity that I've been surrounded with the last 10 years of my life. Thank you so much for uh, allowing us to um, and to share such intimate uh, story. I do honor you and thank you so much because I wanted to um, give you an opportunity because many of your listeners may be in that space. And as you are uh, telling your story and they may hear it, and you gave them some advice as to move forward, to move, to um, uh, extract yourself from that relationship. Because many of them stay because of fearful re reasons. I can't do this. I can't do that. You won't be able to do it if you're not alive anyway. So might as well take the, the opportunity and go. So um, because I knew you mentioned divorce, I knew that it is a painful place, it's a place of trauma. And so when we continue that conversation, we need to talk about how did you heal that broken woman from this place of trauma? So you went after you exited the relationship because I did the same when I came out of mine. I took my kids all over the place and I um, had to learn uh, some things, if you will. So here you are. You are free. You're moving around. You've got yourself to a place where you are now realizing, wait a minute, I am broken. What were those, uh, once you realized that, Elizabeth, I know you mentioned briefly that you went and you ordered, you got some books and you started um, educating yourself. What was, and I call it the statement of faith, what was it that you said to yourself when you got there and you realized, wait a minute, I need help. I, need, I realized something about myself. Um, what was it that you said to yourself and the steps that you took to make that come to pass I uh, said to myself i will never compromise my, myself my integrity and my dignity again I mm. will the bar. and the help that i that i saw was uh spiritual. i went i started finding a um i had baptized my son lutheran and i loved it i started mm -hmm. taking taking myself myself and my son to church every sunday there was a great congregation a lot of older people and I started leaning more towards the older population. So a lot of my friends were 20, 30 years older than I was. Than I was. And that was important to me. Not, not mentioning my family. I mean, they were amazing in terms of supporting and helping me to realize um, and refine who I was. But it was this older population that didn't know that yeah. I met at work or I met through some other avenue that was just amazing and helping me rediscover, rediscover what I've lost. And what is still out there to be to be found so what i did is um in addition to going to church i started just having conversations started going out and meeting people and being able to hear their stories and how they've healed and i took all of that and i rebuilt from the inside and i and and you need you know like they said when you're raising a children you need a village it's the yeah. same thing when you're healing from a broken home from a marriage from any anything that didn't end up in the situation that you hoped. Um, you need more than just sometimes your immediate family that know you, this is who you are, and this is how they expect you. You need a village of new people that don't know you, um, mm -hmm. have never met you, but they're getting to know you, and they see a different side of you that you don't. 
and they help you to flush out that new side of you. And those are, I would say, the threads of hope that you start yeah. to build upon. And that's really what helped me is just having that close knit of friends that are older, that weren't the party, the party goers, <laughs> that weren't the ones that were like, come on, Liz, you have to go. Let's go drinking. Let's go doing that. And I mean, yeah, that's great once in a while. But they were the nurse. They're the ones that have been there, done that. And yeah. then they were able to impart their wisdom and their knowledge and some of the things that they've used to become who they are today. And I think I took all of those life lessons and try to make them practical for myself. So obviously you don't take everything, but you take nuggets of yes. what you hear, of what you learn, and then you apply, you know, you apply them to your own. And that's what I did. And that's what I was able to rebuild for me, myself from the ground up. Um, the other thing that was a great later, I did a lot of uh, soul surf. I took a lot mm -hmm. of trips to the beach and walk on the sand because to me it's freeing yourself, freeing your soul, and being able to reconnect with the lost individual who you who you were, who you were meant to be. So I did a lot of soul searching uh, without friends, without family, just by myself. Because sometimes I believe you to be alone in your head. You need to have that head space where you can really articulate your feelings and be able to sit there and say. This is where I've been. This is where I want to go. But this is where I am right now. And then start building a plan to say, how am I going to get there? And yeah. you're going to get there by putting one foot in front of the next. But you ha there has to be more than that. You have, to, you have to have a close circle of people that are going to be there to support you no matter good, bad. You're not going to have perfect days every day. But if you have those people and you start to rebuild your confidence, start to rebuild who you are, like I said, from that first thread of hope, that's how I did it. That's how I re, I guess I remitted who I was and rebuilt who Elizabeth was from the inside out and regained my confidence and made a promise to myself that I will never compromise myself for anybody, not a man, not a friendship, not anyone, that I am the most invaluable thing. And um, I have to do that, not just for me, but for me. Yeah. If I can't be the independent woman that I sought out to be, then how can I teach him, yeah. you know, that the world has more to offer than he's witnessed in his, sh in his short life at that point. So those were, I think, two of my key motivators. But a lot of that has to come from you. It has to come from within. And then if you have the right support channels around you, that is kind of your halo effect, where it helps to highlight, highlight and, and helps to to pick you up for those days that you're you're having doubt or you're not feeling a hundred. I love the way you um, illustrate that. Uh, mine was meditation, and you talked about meditation. And I tell people meditation comes in many different forms. Um, it's what's meditative to you. That's the true meditation that you need to be in. And some people, like yourself, take walks. Some people are into nature. Uh, some I know I was talking to one lady and she was telling me she was able to do that when she was vacuuming, <laughs> you know, so, but it is that space by which you are able to slow the thoughts that are coming at a million miles a minute. And you began to walk with them, began to have that conversation with yourself. And I tell them, it is important that you start speaking to yourself because you are listening to others talk about you. It is important that you begin to talk about you. You begin to redirect, encourage yourself. I did the same. I still do that. Um, and um, I remember when I was going through my journey, one of the things that I dealt with was shame and guilt. And I remember uh, as I was walking through my painful time and I realized one day that I am a nice person. I like me, but I'm, I'm not perfect. And I remember walking around and just every time I saw myself, I'd kiss my hand. I'm like, mm, I just love this color. And um, my friends, <laughs> they would <laughs> look at me and thought I was losing my mind. <laughs> but I was having a conversation with Ken. It wasn't for them. It was about Ken Primus. I needed to tell him that he was loved. I needed to tell him that he is forgiven. I needed to have a conversation with him. They just saw the conversation and they responded. I didn't, you know, mine, I didn't care uh, what they did, but that conversation was for me. And so I always tell people, learn to speak to yourself, speak kindly to yourself. Why? Because you will believe yourself more so than you will. And as once you believe it, 
It is you, you own it, and you will manifest, you will find yourself activating the actions to bring those things to pass. And before you know it, you're on a different place. You've changed your perspective. And when you've done that, you're on your path. So Elizabeth, here you are, you've got your team, if you will, and it's is necessary to find your team. And I tell people, you find your team in, as Elizabeth said, she found her team in the elderly, the older folks that were around. Why? Because there's lots of wisdom sitting there. Um, when you buy a book, I looked at that as my team. I looked at it as I'm having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the writer of the book. Um, I went, I grew up in a church. And so my, one of the books that I relied heavily on was the Bible, because there are principles in there that is very beneficial to my personal growth. And God is interested in it. So because he's interested, he laid out a ton of it in there. You just have to go look for it. And so I understand as you put this team together and you're gaining your perspective switch. Now, how did you begin to, and I know you were placed in that situation personally, but how did you start looking around to your other peers to notice that they were also lacking in the financial knowledge? You got yourself in debt, $300,000. That is a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And tell us about some of the journey when it comes to moving out from there, because this is where you, as a young girl that thread, um, comes in. And I always tell people your journey is to hook you back up to your youth and you found yourself back into the world of the finances. Talk to us when you found yourself in $300,000 and this little girl looked at herself and said, how did I get here? I need to get out. How did you get there? And how did you get out? The shame, the guilt. Yeah. There were days that I blamed my ex-husband. There were days that I wanted to just blame anybody that I could find. There were days that I was shamed. I was filled with guilt. I thought of myself as a terrible mom. Um, you know, what kind of future am I going to give this little boy? Uh, look what I did. I dug us in the huge hole. Uh, but like I said, I decided that I was tired of sitting on the ground. Um, I was tired of being covered in that dust. I had to get myself up. No one's going to do it for me. And I think that yeah. was the first you have to realize is that you can have a, a good team around you and they can try to keep you up. But if you're not for that step, you're, you're not willing to admit that I can't do this anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm ready to move on. You're the only yeah. one to truly get yourself off the ground because they could pick you up. But if you don't have to stand up, it makes no sense. Yeah. So I was at that point. Enough is enough. I got off the ground, dusted myself off and said, okay, new day and through is my new day. And I made that affirmation to myself and I made mm -hmm. that promise to myself and I started working towards it. I started saying, I started believing in that. I, it's like what you said, when you say something to yourself, it's your voice, you're listening. All yeah. the voices are drowned out. When I started listening and started listening to voice, I started to and believe mm -hmm. what it turned into your behaviors change. Your yeah. behaviors, and that's pretty much what happened. I started looking at doing a lot of reading. How can I dig myself out of here? I started t looking at different products that maybe can help me consolidate some of the debt I was in. I started putting strategic plans, started working um, on myself and gave myself a time frame. And I said, okay, by this time, I'm going to have this amount paid off. And I had to make sacrifices. I mean, yeah. I was the one that got myself in this. I couldn't expect someone else to dig me out, right? Once I accepted the blame was on me and it wasn't on someone else, then I was able to really um, believe in the things I was telling myself. I'm going to get out of this. I'm smarter than yeah. this. I'm better than this. I'm going to do this because I deserve this. I'm going to do this because my child deserves this. I'm going to do this because there's a better future for us. And I started putting together um, budgeting uh, plans. I started putting together scenarios. I started putting together exercises that I would use on a weekly basis. Whenever I was feeling anxiety, breathing exercises, different techniques, how I should mm -hmm. be dealing with different situations. Um, <clears throat> I started putting together different tools and models that helped me to make things a little bit easier um, to manage. So all those different tools, just working and, and I continue to learn. That's that's what I love. It's just learning and to become a sponge and learn and don't give up. On it. It's really yeah. what you through. Having the support is amazing, but it all comes from within. You have to yeah. be ready for that step. You have to be the one speaking 
to yourself every day, you have to make sure that voice is constantly echoing in the back of your head. Every time you reach for that credit card, every time you're reaching for the dollar bill to go spend, you really have to think about, do I really need that? Is that a necessity yeah. or is that a desire? So you have to really reprogram who you are and how yeah. you think about things. And I mean, I went through that. It was 10 years of, of a really hard, you know, but now yeah. I'm two years away from being completely financial and, and financially um, free, debt free, including uh, home, everything. I bought a house cash for my son and uh, oh. that home is almost paid out for. So within the next two years, all the vehicles, homes, loans, everything that was going to be completely paid out for. And that's a huge cry from the little girl that I was. Um, yeah, he's not, that is too, awesome. not so long ago, but I, I guess the lesson that I want to leave uh, people with, we all make mistakes. Things happen in life, right? Uh, illnesses, uh, medical things might happen, you know, that you might have an accident, God forbid, but you just never know. Um, <clears throat> your child gets married unexpectedly. You think it's in the five years from now, they find the right person. You've got to pay for that wedding. I mean, things happen in life, you know, uh, you lose a job or whatever it is. But it's how you deal with it. It's how you think about yeah. it. It's how you, the actions you take after that is what's going to allow you to either succeed or fail. Um, we can maintain a positive mindset, but I think what's important is just ensuring it happened. Now putting together just a plan of action. It happened. Now I have to react, right? But also being proactive. Always have an emergency fund. Always making sure that you're not living paycheck to paycheck. Always making sure that you're living within your means. Yeah, we want to go on vacation. Plan. You want to take that that trip to Paris. Is there a plan? Don't go. You know, we'll go and charge it in your credit card. Now you come back home, you can't even enjoy that vacation. You come back home now, fifteen thousand dollars in debt because while you were in Paris, you thought you were a celebrity. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so it's okay to live in life and things happen, but we have to make sure that we are just being human. Being human doesn't mean that we have to make poor decisions. Um, being human means that we deal with, with things in life. As life throws up lemons, we can either put them in our mouth and make a, a nasty face, or we can squeeze and make lemonade and say, okay, I'm going to sip on this and I'm going to plan how I'm going to take care of this. And I think it's all about attitude. Your attitude is going to help to define your success in life. Yeah. So think I tell people that happen. all the time. Yeah. When your friends are gone, the only thing that remains is your attitude. And okay. when there is no one in that room, it is that person, that relationship with yourself. And uh, one of the principles that one must understand that Elizabeth is talking about, and she's alluded to it so many times, is that of the victimhood. The victim mentality is one that is simply drifting. But if you like that lifestyle, then you will stay there. The Bible says, Jesus says, those who have ears, let them hear. That means there's a responsibility on the hearer to be an active listener. And if he, that hearer is not an active listener, they're going to miss whatever is said. And so, but I said, there's another part of living that one must do. And I call it purposeful creation. And that purposeful creation happens when you began to take control of your life. Until then, when you're drifting and you're, as uh, Elizabeth said, you, when you're in that uh, mindset, the victim mindset, you will always blame everyone, everyone, everyone all the time. But the minute you switch your perspective, as she said, she began to look at herself and said, I got up, dust myself off and said, today is a new day. And then you began to proceed. And I tell most people, the reason why you haven't moved from where you are is because you haven't decided what you want to do. Because once you decide what you want to do and what you want, you will uh, manifest the way you will start doing the necessary work to get out of it. And so you have to decide the life that you want. Do you want to be a life, have the life of a victim? Or do you want to have the life of one that is purposefully creating their life? And I call it the purposeful creator. The purposeful creator is the person that is mindful of the thoughts that they allow and what they do with that thought. And when they release their words, it is purposeful to create an outcome that they desire. 
And so when you come into that type of lifestyle, everything shifts. Every single thing moves because you and I are creators, as I tell people. And we create by way of how we process our thoughts, which manifest into habits and all of these different things is how our brain is wired from how we process the information. So here you are, you've got yourself out. Congratulations, you're two years away. Now, talk to me, Elizabeth, as to how, what did you put together to become a servant and how did you head there to now teach people about your, the way, whatever you've learned, what did you design, how did you put it together, and what is it? So I put together some books, the pens, the exercises that I use, um, and that one session, because as we know as people, we can say that I'm going to do this, but unless you have a, an accountability partner, a spouse, and somebody that says, hey, you said you're going to do this, you do it. If not everybody has that willpower to stay the course, I think that's an, a, an important part of that one-on-one -on -one as well. Is not a daddy that is involved does have a, a really cares about your success and um, put taking all these tools and then creating. Um, it's a seven. It's a seven-step program that I that I've created that will take someone from where they are, assess exactly how they got, and then we create a blueprint of taking them where they want to, to go. And then based on that, basically use a combination of different things. There's there's tactical tools, there's different models, we use exercises, we use, um, there, there's a lot of different um, um, assessments. We do um, different stages. We say, this is where you were, this is where you're at now, so that they can start to celebrate the minor mile milestones, right? Because if you were 100,000 in debt, but now you're 80,000, wow, did you even realize you chipped 20,000 off within the last maybe a couple of months? Yeah. It's seeing those small milestones, you know, or even if it's a thousand dollars, oh, 10,000, now you're at 9,000. You don't ever think that, that that debt was ever going taken care of, but you're starting to feel hope. You're starting to see. So it's a, it's a combination of all those different things and fine tuning the process as we move forward depending on the need, depending on, on the dedication of them. That's an, an important component because we can have someone that says, I am going to be committed for this time, and then they lose, or they're interested. Yeah. They lose interest because, you know, the results are not happening fast enough for them. But if you have someone that's fed up and tired of this life, and they've tried other things, and they're like, you know, this is not what I want, and they're dedicated and involved, and they show up with 100 excitement. You know, that's the same way I'm going to show up and I'm going to be their cheerleader, but I'm also going to teach them how to walk the yeah. same path that I did to get from where they are now of, of that life that they're struggling and it's challenged to where they can see a life of, wow, I can take that vacation. Wow, I can give my child this. Wow, I do that without having to worry when I get home, how am I going to pay that dinner bill, right? You can yeah. have that freedom. You have that abundance. We just have to put together a plan to get you from point A where you are now, which I sometimes think of like stuck. And depending how you move, you can either be in quicksand where you drown or you can, I can give you the hand and you can and, and help you out. But it's all based on the person, on the individual and they, their determination to point A to point. And there's a lot of different steps that we can take, but it all is based on that particular person. Each person will have a different level of commitment to getting the desired results. Some people will achieve it faster. Some people will take a little bit longer. But as long as that commitment level is there, it's definitely doable, feasible. And there's a life of abundance for all of us out there. It's just be ready. For I love that. Hey, guys, everyone that is listening to this conversation, if you, uh, um, you know, we are talking to someone who is $300,000 in debt and who's going to be out of debt in a couple of years. And uh, that takes a lot of discipline. It takes a lot of knowledge. It takes a lot of know-how. And you have someone that is able and willing to assist you in uh, you being where you're at, at a different place where you can say, I'm going to be out of debt in X amount of years. As she, you heard her talk about those that are active creators or active participators within that uh, space to want to come out. They achieve it faster than those that are, um, you know, dabbling, as they say. And so all those active participators that are there and sick and tired of being sick and tired, I want you guys to get in touch with Elizabeth and get into her space. 
uh, we will make sure that all those information is there so that you can really uh, reach her and move from where you are. As she said, she will assist in putting that plan together so that you can take the knowledge and utilize it and get yourself that vacation that you need, get yourself that new car that you need, get yourself that uh, a house that you have been always wanting to get, but with no direction how to get it. I have someone that is able, willing to do it and to help you with it. I want to thank you so much, Elizabeth, for coming to Threads of Enlightenment. This has been good stuff. And you have laid out a plan by which anyone that has listened, she has given the insight to share how you can move through your darkness to your freedom. And freedom comes in your spirit, soul, and body. And it also gives you financial freedom so that you can get on those um, excursions, if you will, and don't have to worry about coming back and being in debt as a result of it. Grab her wisdom, grab her knowledge, drink of her space, and get yourself financially free. Elizabeth, again, thank you so much for coming to Threads. Thank you so much, Ken. It was a pleasure being here and being a guest on your show. And I can't wait to meet all of the lovely people that you are going to be touching their lives. Thank you.